42 million. The art world, where paintings change hands for fortunes. So, thank you very much. But for every known masterpiece, there may be another still waiting to be discovered. This is it. International art dealer Philip Mould and I have teamed up to hunt for lost works by great artists. We use old-fashioned detective work and state-of-the-art science to get to the truth. Science can enable us to see beyond the human eye. Oh, my goodness. Every case is packed with surprise and intrigue. Is it? Or isn't it a Freud, then? But not every painting is quite what it seems. Gosh, why didn't I notice that before? It's a journey that can end in joy. That is enough to support the conclusion that it is by Tom Roberts. <laughs> or bitter disappointment. I don't think it's a work by Gauguin. I'm very sorry. This time on Fake or Fortune, we're on the trail of one of the most popular 19th century Orientalist painters. We've sold pictures by Jerome for, for up to three million pounds. Wow. It's a picture that's been rejected for the last 20 years by the leading expert on Jerome. It was a sore point between us for many years. We'll unearth new evidence that questions the original decision. But this is a bit, feels like a bit of a breakthrough. We'll decipher clues hidden within the painting itself. I can't see any poor quality here. And use cutting edge technology to uncover its secrets. Just the sort of thing that you might associate with a faked painting. But questions remain about its authenticity. I would expect better from Gerald. Can we reveal the truth about this intriguing picture? Every year, we hear from thousands of people asking us to solve a mystery about their artwork. Deciding which ones to investigate can be tricky, but every now and again, we get a request from the far side of the world which is just impossible to ignore. So when we received an email from Los Angeles, California, we were intrigued enough to arrange a special long-distance delivery. You know something, I just love this moment in the investigation when we see the picture in the flesh for the first time. And this is when we can really start to look for clues. So we have what looks like a man at prayer in a mosque, kneeling, hands raised. And a painting with all the appearance, characteristics, of a work by the leading 19th century French painter, Jean-Léon Jérôme. This small oil on canvas is called Arab Prayer and shows exactly that. But whoever painted it was just as interested in the setting. The man is kneeling on a prayer mat with his shoes off, and behind him is a large white structure covered in what appear to be intricate Arabic carvings and geometric patterns. And rather helpfully, we have a signature. Though, as we know, that doesn't necessarily prove anything. But Jerome is, I assume, who the owner thinks this painting is by. And it's up to us to prove one way or the other. Born in 1824, Jean-Léon Jerome was a master painter of the 19th century. At his peak, he was the most famous living artist. His supremely realistic style was hugely successful and in stark contrast to the later Impressionists. His reputation was built on his early paintings of historical or classical scenes, but he's now perhaps best known for his depictions of the Middle East. The painting is owned by John Swihart, who lives in Santa Monica in Los Angeles. John and Kim, very nice to see you. Hello. You as well. Hello. <laughs> We've arranged a video call with John and his wife, Kim. So let's talk about your painting. We've got it here. Mm -hmm. And you bought it in New York, I think, John, is that right? Yeah, I got it in 1999 at Christie's in New York. It was listed as Circle of Jerome, so I put a bid on it. What did you end up paying for it, John? I paid $6,325. Whoa, so that's yeah. quite a lot. And in Circle of Jerome, just to be exactly clear well, what that means? Yeah, so Circle of Jerome, presumably they felt that it, it evoked the work of the great Jerome, but wasn't necessarily by him. Yes. But what made you decide, John, to spend quite so much money on a painting? Well, I'm an artist myself. I've been painting for 50 years. I've studied him for many years, and I felt intuitive 
believe it, it was a Jerome when I first saw it. And I'm assuming those paintings in the background are your paintings, John, are they? Yeah, this is my studio, yeah, and those are my paintings. And what is it that you love about the painting so much? Anything that he actually created, it's, it's like holy scri scripture to me. John, you're clearly a devotee of Jerome. I mean, Kim, how does it, how does it strike you? It's a healthy obsession <laughs> and has been since he was a teenager. There isn't a day that goes by. He's not researching some information. So you're getting as close to the great man as you can. Exactly. Hands on. If it turns out at the end of our investigation that this is definitively not my Jerome, would John have paid a fair price? Well, then, then John, I'm afraid you would have overpaid for it. For a, a not genuine work, um, it's going to be worth little more than a thousand pounds. Okay. However, if it is a genuine work by Jerome, it's going to be worth a hundred thousand or more. Whew, glad I'm sitting down. <laughs> I have to say, I, I rather like the fact that you're both artists. I, I find that artists either make very good critics or very bad critics of other people's work. <laughs> Would you want to have a look at the mm -hmm. painting in a little bit more detail? And John, will you stay on the line and, and yes. I'd like to talk to you a little bit more just about the provenance of the painting and let's see if we can find out how it got to that auction house. To kick off the investigation, we need to get to know our subject better. There's nothing quite like getting up close and personal with a painting. I can see that it's definitely a work of quality. There's a lovely feeling of detail, of observation, and the colours, they're bright, sharp, crisp. And then when you look into the body of the Arab man, you see the way that the folds are done are, are, are rather exquisitely observed. And that sword, isn't that incredible, that sword? It, it really feels like an object done from the life, as it were. What's also evident, and you can see in the upper quarter of the picture, are drawing lines, indications that the artist is working out the composition before applying the paint. And then there's the signature. I always distrust a signature, but it is nonetheless quite a confident-looking script, and I would love to try and work out a little bit more clearly whether it could be genuine. I mean, he was an Orientalist. He responded to the market views of the Middle East, exoticism. So this is just the sort of painting that you associate with Jerome. But if it's not by Jerome, who could have done it? A faker would certainly have had a lot to gain. I can see from John's paintings that he's clearly inspired by Jerome's meticulous style and attention to detail. John, before you bought the painting, you already knew a lot about Jerome, didn't you? Yes, I started painting when I was a teenager. Jerome was the first artist I really fell in love with. I studied his work, and uh, that's how I learned to draw and paint. I wanted to paint just like Jerome. So when I uh, began researching Jerome, there was very little information available on him. But I kept finding articles written about him by Professor Gerald Ackerman. Eventually, in 1980, I ended up uh, contacting him, and that started a, a lifelong friendship with Gerald Ackerman. He's passed away now, but he was the authority on Jerome. He yes. was the man you went to if you wanted to authenticate a painting. Yes. Yeah. And so when you came to buy the painting that you hope is by Jerome, did you talk to Gerald Ackerman about it? No, because he was out of the country at the time, and... Uh, you know, I saw it in the catalog. It looked like an early Jerome to me, so I put a bid in on it. When Jerry came back to uh, the States, I was excited to tell him that I, you know, I got this Jerome that I'm sure is a Jerome. And I didn't realize that he had been the one that had downgraded it to circle a Jerome. Oh, well, hang on a minute. So he, he had already looked at it yeah. and had decided that, in his opinion, it wasn't by Jerome. Yes, and, you know, I didn't know he was the one that did that, so he was very unhappy. So you must have been pretty gutted when you, you heard that Gerald Ackerman had downgraded it. I was upset that he was upset because, uh, like I said, he was a great friend of mine. And so we just sort of never discussed it again. It was a sore point between us for many years. And what did you manage to find out, if anything, about who owned the painting before you bought it? 
It sold at Christie's in 1978 as a genuine Jerome. So it was then a genuine Jerome from that point until your friend Gerald Ackerman downgraded it? Yes. At the auction you bought it at? Yes. Wow. Gosh, that's frustrating, isn't it? Yeah. And if we do manage to establish that it is a genuine Jerome, what will you do with it? I mean, you've had it for 20 years. Will you keep it? Will you sell it? I think we would sell it because, uh, you know, both Kim and I are self-employed, full-time artists. We'd like to have some, you know, money. Also, you know, we've had it so long, I, um, I feel like I'm ready to pass it on to somebody else to enjoy. Well, John, we'll do our best for you, and hopefully it is by the great man Jerome. That'd be wonderful. To get our investigation on the right track, we need to familiarize ourselves with Jerome's work. The date on John's painting is 1858, when Jerome would have been 34 years old. Now, that's relatively early in the career of a man who continued painting well into his 70s. I've asked Fiona to join me at the Wallace Collection in London. Fiona, I was really keen to show you this picture because in many ways it's the high watermark of what Jerome can achieve. And have a look at the background of the painting. Can you see anything? I can see the signature, which looks reassuringly familiar. Oh, and the date. Yeah. It's 1859, so just a year after ours was supposed to be painted. So therefore, stylistically, in terms of what he's capable of, this makes it a really good example. It's called the Drafts Players. And look at the colours. They're stunning, aren't they? And in terms of trying to establish the authenticity of ours, how does this help us? What we're looking for is hyper-realistic skill to show detail. He's just better almost than anyone else, almost before or afterwards. But also it's a question of getting into the picture, seeing the technique, seeing how he mixes his paints and how he applies his brush and comparing it to known works. We need forensically to get to grips with it. I think one of the reasons that, that Jerome was so successful was that he managed to transport his viewers to, to a different place and a different time in such a convincing way. There's another painting, though, a little bit further down. I'd love to show it to you because it's a great example of some of the issues that we're facing. I think there's some really fascinating, but also rather worrying, connections with our picture in this. Have a look at it. Well, the thing that really jumps out at you is that sumptuous, gorgeous golden robe and painted in a way that surely is very similar to our painting. Well, I couldn't agree more. I think in, in terms of its quality and its composition, it's highly comparable to ours. But here's the rub. Look what it says on the frame. A follower of Jerome. So they don't think it's by Jerome then? No, so the term follower, rather like a circle, means that in their belief it is not actually by the artist. It's someone imitating them. And this is where the problem lies, because I think this is a wonderful quality object. Also the date, 1859, same as the oh. one we've just seen, you know. Absolutely bang on when we want it to be, uh, Jerome. And yet, despite all the similarities, their belief is that this is not good enough. I was feeling rather encouraged having looked at that last painting and looking at this one. I'm now feeling discouraged all over again. Well, I mean, it just shows. Yet again, we're in troubled and complex waters and we've got to make sure that our picture is so good, has got all the ingredients necessary if it's going to pass the winning post. Before I go any further, I need a better understanding of Orientalism and Jerome's place in it. I'm on my way to Sotheby's, where their expert, Claude Peening, has overseen the sale of a number of record-breaking Orientalist paintings. Jerome is described as an Orientalist. Can you explain what that means for us? So Orientalism was um, the name given to a, a whole new genre in art in the mid-19th century. Orient referring at that time to North Africa, the Middle East and Turkey. There was this opportunity for artists as well as travellers to make it across to these countries. And Jérôme was one of them. 
You could imagine what they must have seen getting off the boat, the light, the colors, and it fed this new genre of painting for audiences in Europe and America. Jérôme traveled to Turkey in the 1850s, to Egypt from the mid-1850s right through until the 1880s. Orientalism has not been without its critics, it's fair to say, and, and has had attracted some controversy over the years. There are certain artists, I think, who could be criticized for depicting the East as a sort of exotic place, which was somehow to be looked down upon. It's us and them. And less civilized than the Less civilized. And, you know, the pictures of harems, for example, I would say do conjure up a very inaccurate picture of what the East really looked like. I mean, for a start, no Western painter, certainly no male painter, would have had access to the harem. You know, whereas Jerome created very respectful narratives with a view to shedding the Orient in a very positive light. Is it possible that if our painting is indeed by Jerome, it represents a real person and a real place? The picture probably brings together different observations that Jerome made on his travels. He would have been familiar with the mosques both of Istanbul, or Constantinople as was, and with the mosques of Cairo. Paintings like Jerome's fell out of favor, didn't they? He was hugely popular yes, in his time. that's right. And then completely fell out of that's fashion. Right. I think it was more taste that resulted in Orientalism falling out of fashion for quite a, a large part of the 20th century. And now? Uh, uh, but now there has been this remarkable resurgence from people, collectors, institutions, museums, in the very countries depicted in the paintings. The reason for this is that uh, Orientalist art paints a picture of how those countries looked a hundred or more years ago, at a time when photography was only just beginning, and this has contributed to a growth in prices. And taking Jérôme as just a, one example, I mean, you know, we, we've sold in these very rooms pictures by Jérôme for, for up to three million pounds. Wow. I'm not saying every Jérôme is worth that much, but his work is capable <laughs> of achieving I get too excited, such prices. Right. But still, yeah. it just is, is an indication Absolutely. of the amount of interest there is. Absolutely wonderful to see that interest, yeah. I want to see what science can tell us about John's picture. I've sent it to Aviva Bernstock, head conservator at the Courthold Institute in London. The technology she uses, combined with her expert eye, could reveal vital clues for our investigation. So, Viva, yet again, we're in need of your scientific eye. We have a painting which may or may not be by Jean-Léon Jérôme. Well, it's certainly a really interesting painting. It's very finely painted. Well, what we could do quickly is to look in ultraviolet light to see something of its condition. What do you think? Okay. Actually, this is rather exciting. We've never done this before on Fake or Fortune. It's a whole different way of looking at a painting. What you can see in ultraviolet light is areas that fluoresce in UV and look bright, and contrasting areas that look darker, which in this case look like they've been applied over varnish. The ultraviolet lamp is showing up uh, another layer of activity. It's almost as if you're, you're seeing the unseen picture, the soul of the painting. Yeah, well, it certainly looks like somebody, either the artist or perhaps a restorer, has covered up certain areas of the painting. I'm not quite sure why that was. And are there other things you might also be able to tell us about the painting? Yes, I mean, if I, for example, look in infrared or make an X-ray, I can look at the technique of painting. Well, we'd appreciate anything you can tell us. OK. Thank you. Claude at Sotheby's says Jerome painted real places. So I want to find out if there are any clues in the composition itself to help focus our research. I've come to the Suleymaniye Mosque in East London to meet Professor Doris Behrens Abusaif, one of the country's leading experts on Islamic cultural history. Doris, very nice to see you. As you know, Doris, we're looking at a painting which may or may not be by Jerome. And Jerome is an artist that you like. 
Yes, as an historian of Islamic art and architecture, specialized in Cairo, I have used the Orientalist painters first as a, uh, as a source of a documentation. So let's look at the painting here. Obviously, there's a man at prayer. What about this structure behind him here? The structure is a mimba, so it's the pulpit which is used in mosques for the sermon, the Friday sermon. So that's... Presumably like, that... Exactly, like this one. In the corner there. So it's always on the right side of the prayer niche, which we have here, which gives the Mecca orientation. And the fact that he is facing this way to worship, would he not be facing the other way? Absolutely. He is praying entirely in the wrong direction. So he's not praying towards Mecca, he's actually praying away from it. Yeah. It's not only away, but he's giving his back to the prayer niche, which is a, oh, clearly a mistake. And he's put his shoes here, next to him. Normally, the good thing to do is to put the shoes such that the sword don't touch the, the carpet or the floor. Something is not quite correct. The way he's kneeling and the way he's holding his hand, this position of the hands is, is a bit unfamiliar to me. Right. Is there anything in this painting that could give us any clues as to the location? The mimba was likely not from Cairo. In Cairo, traditionally, the mimbas were made of wood as portable structures, like the one we see here, and most likely has to be located somewhere in Turkey. And because how can you tell? In Turkey, it is traditional to make the mimbas in marble or stone. What about the inscriptions and the decoration we're seeing on the carpet, on the minbar behind him? The inscriptions are, are pseudo-inscriptions, they are fantasy. Well, they, they, they're, they're just not gibberish. Copies. Yeah, gibberish. <laughs> but on the basis of this conversation, it's certainly not encouraging, Doris, because <laughs> you're pointing out so many things that are just historically not right about this picture. I mean, you don't look for historical precision and exactitude when you look at Orientalist painters, but here still it is, it is a different kind of error. Uh, I would expect better from Jerome. Which just looked like mistakes, do you think? The homework was not done well. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Abu Saif pointed out a number of things that are culturally wrong about the picture. But the question for us is, does that necessarily mean that it's not by Jerome. Could it be that Jerome, lover of the Orient that he was, did get things wrong? Understanding how Jerome worked could be key to this investigation. But first, I need to look into the history of our picture and who owned it. Perhaps that will deliver some more leads. I've come to the Cambridge University Library where they have one of the very few available copies of the catalogue resume. The catalogue is the definitive list of all works by the artist and the starting point for any provenance research. The fact that there are so few copies in circulation shows how little Jerome is studied and what a difficult job we've got on our hands. This is the catalogue resume by Gerald Ackerman, our owner John's great friend. And it's in French, which I think is probably an indication of how little call there was for it in the English-speaking world. Here's John's painting. Arab at prayer, and it's described very clearly as cercle de Jérôme, so circle of Jérôme, not by the man himself. And this was Gerald Ackerman's view. What's interesting about this is it has the history of the painting. So, just working backwards, it mentions the sale on the 1st of November 1999 in New York, which is where John bought the painting. But then we go back further in time. We've got the sale here in London, 31st of March, 1978, and it is listed as by Jean-Léon Jérôme. So 1978, unequivocally, it was thought to be by the man himself, Jérôme. Then we can go further back in time, back to 1971, and there's an exhibition in New York at the Schickman Gallery called The Neglected 19th Century. And I've got the catalogue for that as well. And here we have the picture, slightly different title, Praying Arab. But again, the painting is listed as being by none other than Jerome. So what we've got is from 1971 through 1978, all the way up to 1999, John's painting is clearly, unequivocally attributed to Jerome. And that changed with Gerald Ackerman in 1999. So what we need to do 
is go further back than 1971. Where was this painting before this exhibition in New York at the Shipman Gallery? The commentary that goes with John's painting here in the catalogue is even more interesting. Cette peinture sont la même main, so this painting appears to be by the same hand as the painting listed above, which is number 119. That's the same painting we saw in the Wallace Collection, unit guarding a door, described there, if you remember, as follower of Jerome. So Ackerman thinks it's by the same hand as the person who did that picture. It then goes on to say, un dessin préparatoire, which means a preparatory sketch, just as Paul, he also didn't think much of it, and found at the Cooper Art Gallery in Barnsley, bracket South Yorkshire, remember this is French people reading this, does not help to confirm the attribution. There's lots to pick out of that. First of all, most excitingly, it tells us there is a preparatory sketch for John's painting. What on earth it's doing in Barnsley, I have no idea. So that's a really exciting breakthrough. Less exciting is the fact that Ackerman describes it as aussi faible, so just as poor, as the painting of the eunuch guarding the door. He doesn't think much of that either. And also the fact that he says it doesn't help to confirm the attribution. Surely that sketch in Barnsley could be useful to our investigation, even though Gerald Ackerman dismissed it. Frustratingly, I've still got more questions than answers, but this feels like a good time to catch up with Philip back at the gallery. I'm really heartened by you having uncovered a reference to that sketch. And what I want to do is go down to Barnsley, have a look at it, make sure it's the real thing, it's not a copy. Well, to be honest, we could do some good news because the world authority on Jerome at the time, Ackerman, uh, was deeply unimpressed by mm. our painting. There are some, frankly, wrong cultural references in it. And then the location, is it a real location? We just don't know. Mm. Do you know, and I've got a problem, a sort of niggling underlying problem with the anatomy. Now, just have a look at this. Look carefully at that neck. Uh, there's a detail here. This is an artist who's known for his exactitude. It looks a bit fat. <laughs> and then have a look at this. Look carefully at those hands in relation to the body. Aren't they just a bit too big? Well, I have to say, I had not noticed that. But now you've pointed out, I can't see anything but that. And you would think, yes, an artist of the quality of Jerome would get that right. So what I'm hoping is when I go to Barnsley, this drawing, if it's right, might well, I don't know, explain it. Because frankly, at this stage, our neck's on the line. See what you did there. <laughs> I'm on my way to Barnsley. In the center of town is the Cooper Gallery which has the drawing that Ackerman referred to in his catalogue raisonné. Samuel Joshua Cooper was a wealthy 19th century industrialist from here who set up his gallery to hold all the French artwork he'd collected over the years. I love going to the heart of the gallery like this. The unseen pictures, so many clues and answers can be found in places like this. I think we're in Jerome country. And here, here is our image. This is the drawing that I'd come to see. I mean, there's no question about it. It's the same composition, isn't it? I mean, he's kneeling there, his hands are up, he's in what looks like a sort of sacred interior. The big key now to understanding our picture more and understanding this is to try and work out could this be a copy of ours? Is it, you know, just someone who's seen our painting or a version of it just doing a replica? And for that, the answers lie within the drawing itself. First thing I've noticed, actually, is the positioning of the sword. If you look just above the pommel, you can see that the artist has just moved it. There's two or three different positions. You can see why because it is so important, you know, it cuts, it cuts the picture in half. It's a, a semi-diagonal that takes your eye. Then there's that hand. I was a bit worried about the proportion. I've still got a little bit of that issue. Again, you know, just the sort of indication that this is an artist working out an idea 
seeking a solution. I've also just noticed the slippers in the bottom left-hand corner, which are actually compositionally quite important. They allow you to, to walk into the picture slightly. And they are in a different place. They're on the prayer mat and slightly pointing in a different direction. This is clearly someone who's saying, does it work? In other words, a preparatory drawing, not to copy. It surely has to be by the same hand as John's painting. The question now is whether this is an early work by Jerome when he was still finding his way as an artist, or the work of a master forger meticulously planning a deception. If so, would anyone really go to these lengths to create a forgery? I've been looking into the provenance, trying to find an unbroken paper trail all the way from John back to Jerome. It's a notoriously hard task with any artist, let alone someone who's been in and out of popularity as much as Jerome. So up until now, we've only managed to take John's painting back to New York in 1971. How did it get there? Well, it came from a man called Henri Robert, from Paris in 1970. So who was he? Well, Henri Robert is a fantastically common French name. So we looked to try and find the most likely candidates called Henri Robert that the painting could have come from. And in fact, there was one who was a Chanel parfumier, rather marvellously. So we talked to his descendants to see if it could indeed be him. And it looks like the answer is no, and it's not, rather disappointingly, that Henri Robert. And as for the others, well, we've hit a dead end. It doesn't look like we can take John's painting any further back than this mysterious Monsieur Robert in 1970. So the only other way to approach it then is to do it from the other end and start from Jerome and work forwards and see if we can get to John that way. Now, Jerome had a very close connection with the art dealer Goupil through marriage and he sold his paintings almost exclusively through Goupil. So we looked through Goupil's ledgers. Frustratingly, there is no reference in Goupil's ledgers to a painting called An Arab at Prayer. Cannot find it anywhere. But there is a reference to a painting called A Turk at Prayer, Un Turc en Prière. Here it is. Now, when it comes to John's paintings, we know now that it could be an Arab man at prayer. It could also be a Turkish man at prayer. So is this Un Turc en Prière, in fact, John's painting? The first thing to do is look for the dimensions. Disappointingly, the dimensions are not here. What we have got, though, is the price that Goupil bought it for in 1861, which was 1,000 francs. It then sold on for 5,000 francs, and then 4,500 francs to another art dealer called Gombard in 1863. And after 1863, it just seems to disappear into thin air. There is no record of it. It's just vanished. So where is it? This is as far as I've been able to get. This mysterious A Turk at Prayer in 1863, and then John's painting surfacing in 1970 in Paris, before it goes off to New York. That's about a hundred year gap in the provenance, which is not good. Could it be what was originally called A Turk at Prayer and is now known as an Arab at Prayer? It's a very tantalizing prospect, but I can't can't quite prove it. There's more research to be done on the sketch I saw at the Cooper Gallery. Across the road is Barnsley's Town Hall, which holds numerous documents relating to Cooper's collection. It's just wonderful how across Britain one can occasionally find these phenomenal collections. And one can only imagine the impact that those drawings and paintings owned by Samuel Cooper must have had in the day on his friends. And here, next to me, is the archive of his notebooks. The exoticism of Jerome's Orientalist work was exactly the sort of art that appealed to newly rich industrialists like Samuel Cooper. I seem to be holding what is an inventory of Cooper's pictures, a little red book, and by coming to 
G, you've got Jerome. Pencil sketches bought at Rue Lafitte in Paris, where Jerome was living. This has to refer to the drawing, surely, that we've just seen. And what I find so reassuring is that he bought that drawing in Paris in 1891 when Jerome was alive. That's proper provenance. I, I think that's another really good reason to believe that drawing. Well, there are some other documents here. So this is, scroll forward 100 years, a letter from Gerald Ackerman, the Jerome scholar. And he's writing to the Cooper Gallery we've just been in about their drawing. So he starts with a heading, Praying Man en face. This is after a painting on wood, which I have long doubted. Trouble is, he's saying it's on wood. John's is on canvas. The finished panel, he says, is weak in so many places that it's never stayed long in any collection. I think that's just a rather unkind way of saying that it doesn't, doesn't stand up. I'm enclosing a small photo for you. Let's have a look. Yes, very clearly, the same composition. And I think you'll see how weak it is, referring to the photograph in the chin, in the drapery that puckers instead of falling with its own weight. This is strong stuff. He's you know, not giving this picture a chance. In fact, I'm sure it is by the same forgerer who did the eunuch guarding a door, signed Jerome, in the Wallace collection. That was the picture that we saw. So he's saying that the drawing, the painting, and the one in the Wallace collection are all by the same sinister hand, this, this forgerer, as he calls it. Well, I have to say that in art historical terms, this is very damning. He hasn't left any chance for it being right. And we're going to need to revisit this and represent the argument with real vigor if we're going to prove John's painting. When Jerome wasn't traveling, he lived and worked in Paris. The archives there might hold a record of the places he visited and painted, and maybe even a clue to our painting. Papers relating to his life are held at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. So we asked for the help of a researcher in Paris who sent me a copy of his diaries. I've got one of a limited number of copies here, and this is Jerome talking about his time in Egypt in 1856. I'll just translate it as I go along. So, départ pour l'Egypte. So, departure for Egypt. My short stay in Constantinople whetted my appetite, and the Orient is the most frequent of my dreams. We come to Cairo, where we stay for four months in one of the houses of Solomon Pasha, who was an, an official. Lots of paintings, beaucoup de tableaux, more or less successful, more or less to the taste of the public, were made à la suite de ce séjour after this stay by the banks of the Father of Rivers, so that's the Nile. So the key thing about this is it puts Jerome in Cairo in 1856, and he talks about paintings that he did after his stay in Cairo, presumably on his return to Paris. And you think about John's painting, his painting was painted in 1858, so the timing is perfect for Jerome coming back from Egypt setting up in his studio attic in Paris and painting. Was this one of those paintings? And what about the mosque? Did Jerome visit a mosque in Cairo that looks like the one in John's painting? That's what we need to find out. Still so many questions. Time to regroup with Philip. We've hit a dead end with the Provence, I'm afraid. I can take the painting back to 1970 but I cannot firm up this 1863 Goupil provenance. So that's a hundred year gap. So what have you got? So I've been doing some of my own research, but this time concentrating on the clothes. This is a model in Jerome's studio. And we know that he took intense trouble to make sure that he got the clothes right, even importing them from the Middle East. Look at that soldier there. And here we have in his studio, a photograph of a model wearing original clothes. 
Now, I want you to have a look at, in particular, the sword. Oh, yes. Clearly looks identical, doesn't it, to the one in our painting? I mean, it has to be, doesn't it? If you look at the, the face of the model, does that strike you as familiar? I mean, I'm wondering if it is the same person that's in our painting. I mean, the tash is a bit different. It doesn't stick out quite as much. But the profile, the nose? I, I, I would agree. Also, the strong bridge above the eyes. He's got the clothes and the model. And if it is by Jerome, he's done the painting back at his studio in Paris with that model. What we do know is that Jerome was in Cairo at about the right time for our painting, and he liked to paint real locations. So I wonder if that can help us. Actually, it's funny you should say that, because do you think that this could be one and the same place, this temple interior? The minbar, I mean, there's definite similarities there, aren't there? And that is a mosque in Cairo? It is. Well, in that case, we need to pursue that, don't we? We need to find someone in Cairo who can help us find that minbar. At last, it feels like we're onto something. But first, I need to catch up with Aviva at the Courtauld Institute to see what she has found. Hello, Aviva. Hello. Have we found anything idiosyncratic, anything that might set the technique apart from others? I have done a technical analysis, which involves some technical imaging, so starting off with an X-ray. But what's really interesting about the X-ray to me is that the raised hand, the left hand of the figure, the background has been drawn very precisely around it. Now, it's a very small scale. It's a very meticulous technique using tiny brushes, which is you know, an extremely detailed way of painting. It's quite, it could be quite characteristic. Are you saying, then, the artist has come back with a brush, having painted the hand, and painted around it in order to, what, give it greater definition? Exactly that. And that's reinforced by looking at an infrared image, which I can show you. So this infrared image is quite amazing because it shows you very detailed underdrawing of the composition. So not only is the figure drawn in great detail, but also all the architectural elements and all the decorative elements in the composition are drawn in underneath a very thin paint layer but it's as if he's left nothing to chance. Every aspect of the painting has been decided beforehand. Absolutely. Now, what about this worrying thing that I haven't been able to get out of my head, and that is the fluorescing overpaint, the, the, the suggestion that someone might have done something or added a layer to this picture? Well, here's the UV image that we saw earlier. You can see the contrast between the dark areas of paint that have been added over the varnish. Uh, but since I saw you last, I've been able to take a detail of the signature, which you can see very clearly in the ultraviolet here, which has also been added over the top of the varnish. Uh, so now we've got to add the thought that the signature, and not just other areas of the picture, have been added, which is presumably, in my experience, just the sort of thing that you might associate with a faked painting, where the signature has deliberately been put on at a later date to take people in. A later signature over the varnish is to me a big red flag. You see it often used to deceive buyers, but rarely on genuine works. Does this now point to John's painting being a fake? Or can we prove it was something that Jerome himself did? I need to get a deeper understanding of Jerome's distinctive traits. Are there patterns or quirks in John's picture that can be seen in other Jerome paintings? Back home in Oxfordshire, I've arranged a video call with Jerome scholar Guluru Chakmak. It's lovely to have your, your expertise on the programme, so... Um, well... Guru is one of a new generation of Jerome scholars. She studied his technique in detail and has written extensively on his work. She's based at Amherst, near Boston, on the east coast of America. So why don't we kick off and start talking about the picture then? So let's look at the background. This thinly painted red background in the upper right is referred to in the academic parlance of the period as the ebosh. The so ebosh. The underpainting later that would be painted on top of the primed canvas. And such thinly painted surfaces occur in Jerome's paintings from the late 1850s onwards. It seems to me quite a, an unusual thing for an artist 
to, to leave an area, well, it looks unfinished, doesn't it? The conclusion that I reach is that the artist wants to remind us that this is an artifact huh? that comes out of the hand of the artist, the world as filtered through the imagination of the artist. So this area is his sort of way of saying, I'm here, I'm an artist, don't forget. Absolutely, yes. What about other aspects of the picture? Is, is there anything you think it's trying to tell you in relation to what might be a Jerome? Yeah, the subject matter. He exhibited a painting in Paris at the Salon of 1857. Uh, its title we translate to English as Prayer in the House of an Arnold Chief. And in that painting, he shows a row of various ethnic types that belong to a militia. The figure in your painting seems to belong to that, uh, the entourage of the chief. No, actually, Guru, that is really fascinating. So, I'm looking at it now. So the central figure has got the same bone structure. Yeah, absolutely, yes. It may even be based on the same model, perhaps. There is another figure, uh, the red-haired figure wearing a yellow costume to the left of the central figure, and he seems to be wearing the same robe <laughs> as the figure in your painting. I can't help noticing the slippers in the foreground. We've got a rather similar pair to, to some of those that I can see. These slippers appear again and again in Jerome's other Orientalist paintings later on in the 1870s. Whenever you see a mosque scene, you always see these slippers. Moving from the slippers to the rug, uh, we know that this inscription is a work of imagination, don't we? Is this something that that you would find in a Jerome, a man who, who took his job so seriously? Let's imagine ourselves being painters. Photography has been declared to the world in 1839 with the invention of the daguerreotype, right? If photography can already do what you can do, how do you justify painting? He could have painted it very precisely if he wanted to, right? But he doesn't, he's not trying to copy it. He just wants to transport us to the idea of the East as filtered through the artist's imagination, experience, understanding of the world. Knowing how you know Jerome, do you feel it's by him? Well, I would need to see the painting itself. If it's by Jerome, I think it will be an important one that will find its place in the narrative of Jerome's turn from history painting, let's say, to Orientalism. Mm. So that's exciting. If it is by Jerome, it's a pivotal, it's a crucial one in terms of his stylistic development. Absolutely. Even though Professor Abu Saif thought the stone minbar in John's painting suggested Istanbul, our investigation has shown that Cairo could still be the location of the mosque. Cairo is such a fascinating place. It made a big impact on me when we visited for one of the first fake or fortunes, as it did on Jerome when he was there in 1856. Hi, Dina. Very nice to see you in Cairo. Dina Bakum is a specialist in cultural heritage conservation in Cairo, and she's been in touch with some news. So we sent you our picture to see if you could identify this rather mysterious minbar that our man is praying in front of. I wonder what you found. The minute you send the picture, I actually knew right away that this is a minbar commissioned in Cairo by a sultan named Kaibei in the 15th century. Have you been able to go to the mosque, Dina? Yes, and I've sent you also some images of the minbar. So what is it that struck you particularly then? That it's a stone minbar, the composition, but the most striking element is the engaged column that you see on the right-hand side of the painting with this very intricate geometric design. It's exactly the one that you see in the picture where that we have sent you. This cannot be a coincidence. It is the same minbar. That's so encouraging that you took one look at our painting and thought, I know that minbar, I know it exists, and that column is unique. What about the panel up the side? If you look at the balustrade, you see that he placed some inscription, which actually doesn't exist in the original member, but there is another painting, a genuine Jerome, young Greeks in the mosque. Yes, I've got it here, yeah. So here, you see that our same balustrade, 
you see that it's a stone member and you see the flank in the background decorated with this star patterns. I mean, just playing devil's advocate for a minute here, Dina. We know in the genuine Jerome that everything about the minbar is fully decorated and in ours it is not. And I just wonder why he wouldn't do it in, in this one. My feeling is for aesthetics. I think if we would have had the whole decoration with the star patterns on the flank, it would have been too much. And maybe the man would not stand so much out. I wonder if he uh, could have drawn it based on photographs because the Jerome sometimes did that. Yeah. But I do have the feeling that he must have been in, in the mosque. The area where this mosque is, the Northern Cemetery, was a very visited mosque with lots of appeal to all the travellers, the artists, the photographers. That's really encouraging, Dina. Thank you so much. I, I, I worried when we asked you to, to, to look into this that actually we were going to come to a bit of a dead end. But this is a, feels like a bit of a breakthrough. Dina, thank you so much. So grateful. It's a pleasure. I've had news from Aviva. She's done a technical comparison between John's painting and the genuine work by Jerome. She's come to the gallery with her findings. OK, Aviva, break it to us. Is it good news or bad news? I've had a chance to look at the Wallace Collection drafts players and made some interesting comparisons. So a known, accepted, documented work by Jerome. Absolutely. And what's really fascinating is this is a UV photo of the drafts players, is that, again, we see the signature applied on top yeah. of a varnish, exactly the same as the Arab in prayer. And not only that, we see other similarities in the underdrawing, and you can see that the whole grid or the, the table that the drafts players are sitting on, the drafts board, are, is all done in fine detail underneath the yeah. paint film. It's all drawn in, just the same as the detailed architecture in The Praying Man. So the idiosyncratic things that were worrying about John's picture are to be found in another work by Jerome. Absolutely, and I think even more compelling is the way that the faces and hands are painted in the two paintings. Very fine brush strokes. It'd be very hard to mimic that. They're very, very similar to each other. Well, I think, technically speaking, we've got a really strong case here. I think we're almost ready to present it. So that signature on top of the varnish, which looked like a worrying sign of forgery, turns out to be something that Jerome had a habit of doing. I'm feeling increasingly hopeful about this painting. We've gathered together all our evidence and, along with the painting, sent it to the leading authority on Jerome, Dr Emily Weeks. She is now the person who decides whether a work is genuine or not. Have we done enough to determine once and for all that this is a work by Jerome and not a carefully crafted forgery? I think, Philip, we've gone as far with this as we can go now. So let's look at the case for and against. Yeah, it seems to me that stylistically and technically, we really, we really achieved what we set out to do. You know, we now know that he did use a process that looks like overpaint. No, he used underdrawing. The quirks of this picture are things that we can expect to see in a genuine work by Jerome. Culturally, not so good, because there are quite a few things that are wrong with our picture. He's got his back to the minbar, which someone would not do in a mosque. And then let's not forget, we've got a hundred year gap in the Provence. Mm. And you could throw in that letter from Ackerman, which does give you some reason for concern. He's referring to another image. I mean, could there therefore be an original painting of which this is just no more than a mere copy? Let's not forget, though, that when Ackerman was downgrading this painting in, what, 1999, the internet was in relatively early days. He didn't have access to anything like the kind of digital technology to look at things online in the way that we can. Mm. And also, I have to say, I was warmed by that drawing. You know, it, it did look as though it was preparatory for our painting. It felt linked. So now we need Emily to have a look and give us her verdict.
After three nail-biting weeks, Emily's judgment arrives. Time to call John and Kim. Hello there. How are you both? Doing we're, great. Yeah, we're good. A little nervous. <laughs> so we've sent you your painting back. You've got it there. I think for this moment, we should probably have it out on the easel. Do you want to unwrap it? OK. There he there is. There it is. So how does it feel to have him back in pride of place? Depends on what the, uh, the <laughs> results are. <laughs> well, first of all, let's just remind ourselves why you fell in love with it in the first place. I've had this painting for over 20 years and have always felt that it was a Jerome, but now that I'm going to actually find out, <laughs> I'm pretty nervous <laughs> about it, I gotta admit. <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to add a, another picture to, to the corpus of works by this artist who, who I've really got to admire? If it isn't by Jerome, I'm going to uh, spend the rest of my life being teased by a lot of my friends, <laughs> I can tell you that. So I have here... <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'm going to open it. Are you ready? Yes. Yes. Dear Fake or Fortune, I have received the painting presently known as At Prayer, thought to be by the 19th century French artist Jean-Léon Jérôme, and the dossier of research notes compiled by your team. As you know, these notes alone are not sufficient to determine the authenticity of this work, as they leave many questions outstanding and raise issues that warrant further investigation. Having examined the work firsthand, however, I am left with no doubt that this painting is indeed an early work by Jérôme, <laughs> and I will be including it in my revision of the artist's catalogue raisonné as such. Congratulations, she says. <laughs> uh, uh, wow. Well, that, that to me, in art world terms, sounds like a resounding yes. I feel vindicated. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there are lessons to be learned from your picture, from studying it, that might well apply to other pictures out there that could be by Jerome, but possibly for whatever reason, because of history, haven't. And in terms of value, it's going to be worth £100,000, probably more. Just reading on in the letter, Emily goes on to say, I look forward to emphasising the insights it provides into the artist's evolution, from a painter of neo grec and classical scenes to arguably the most influential and important Orientalist painter of the 19th century. Mm. I mean, it's a fantastic letter. So mm. how do you feel looking at it now? Yeah, it looks... He's saying, thank God. <laughs> it looks like a masterpiece now. <laughs> it's amazing to finally know that it's actually a Jerome. So thank you guys for, Absolutely. for this. Absolutely. Well, we've loved working on it, haven't we? Oh, we, we couldn't be more thrilled. We really couldn't for you both. It's just wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. I'm so happy for John and Kim. I mean, they are thrilled, as are we, and you wouldn't meet a lovelier couple. And actually, reading the letter... Do you remember how you were troubled by the thick neck and the fact that the hand seemed so big relative to the size of the head? Well, Emily Weeks has written in here, the weaknesses of the figure were typical of the artist's figurative works at this time. So the thick neck came good for us in the end. And I think we've witnessed something else today, and that, that is that sort of jolt when art history moves on. And there are going to be a lot of other pictures out there that now need to be reconsidered, paintings that we ourselves have seen may now soon get the full mantle of an attribution to the, to the great Jean-Léon Jérôme. If you think you have an undiscovered masterpiece or precious object, contact us at bbc.co.uk slash fake or fortune.